he's going to be talking about quantum optical mechanics. Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot to the organizers for having me. Um, what I'm going to do now during my talk is I would like to introduce you to the idea of putting mechanical systems, I'm talking about micro and nanomechanical systems, into the quantum regime. And um, the way we want to do that is by exploiting a toolbox of quantum optics. And um, I would uh, well, simply like to point out the different perspectives that um, putting mechanical systems into the quantum regime has, in particular for quantum information processing, sensing, and eventually for addressing in a new way questions on the foundations of physics. Uh, of physics. So when you think about mechanical systems, um, then in the context of physics, then normally you think about sensing. Right? So this is one of the first things that come to your mind. And this is actually one of the three motivations that I would like to, um, to, to introduce you to you a little bit in my, in my, in my introduction. So uh, one of the first nice examples of how um, mechanical oscillator has been used for sensing is in the context of determining the, uh, actually the density of the Earth. So that, uh, this was a conjecture that was put out by Newton that uh, the, uh, who actually conjecture the density of the Earth is something like five point uh, something the, the density of water, um, which he uh, inferred from assuming that the, that the Earth is not simply a solid rock, but is actually um, a shell with a, with, a, with a fluid core. And um, so this conjecture by Newton motivated many researchers to try to measure the density of the Earth. And one of the first experiments, uh, if not the first really um, systematic one, is one that has been almost forgotten now, is, uh, is an expedition by someone called Maskeline, who um, actually went to Scotland. They found a mountain there, the Mount Chihelian, which is a very nicely, a very nice isotropic um, uh, um, piece of hill, <laughs> I would say. Uh, somewhere in the, the middle of nowhere and uh, they actually just took um, pendula and um, were measuring the gravitational attraction between the mountain and the, and, and the pendula um, on different locations around the mountain. The expedition took a year or so and they concluded that um, within some error bar Newton's conjecture is not really correct. Uh, which again inspired Cavendish many years later to perform his well-known experiment. And if you read the original paper by Cavendish, at the very end he comments on the Maskelyne expedition, also said that this sort of motivated him, gives reasons why the error in this first experiment was so large, actually because they didn't know the um, density distribution inside the mountain that gave rise to extremely large errors. And uh, Cavendish, of course, concluded that Newton's conjecture was correct up to, like, um, I think, 10% or so. Um, so, the last, what do we have, um, 200 years, the situation has uh, improved somewhat in the field of mechanics. And I think one of the next big steps has been uh, some, from, from, from the, from the uh, 90s on the development of nanomechanical uh, devices with the explicit um, purpose to improve sensing. And I just put here, um, put here a couple of uh, examples from labs all over the world. Uh, particularly nice ones um, down here, for example, from the Schwab lab. is a nanomechanical resonator that is capacitively coupled to a single electron transistor. So here the tunnel junctions and there's only a single electron that can actually, actually live on these islands here. Uh, so you have single electron coupling to this one. Or here, for example, in the Leonard lab, again, an atomic force, po uh, atomic point contact that couples here to this nanomechanical um, system. Uh, so why does nanomechanics help with respect to sensing? Here's one uh, uh, example. This was also the, the, the um, prominent motivation also in the Lucas lab in the beginning. Simply improve mass sensing. Okay, what is the idea? The idea is if you have a mechanical resonator, you can measure its frequency, you add some mass to the mechanical resonator, the frequency shifts, and um, if you have a sufficiently sharp spectral response, you can actually measure the frequency shift, which provides you um, uh, information about the mass shift. But the mass sensitivity scales then, of course, that you can resolve with the so-called Q-factors with the spectral sharpness 
of your mechanical system. And here's a beautiful example from the settle group. They actually used a carbon nanotube, um, which, has, um, uh, which has a very low mass. And of course, now if you add a single gold atom, the frequency shifts already in a way that you can measure the shift, and you have mass sensitivity down at the, um, at the, the single atom level. So in that case, it's in the order of uh, some yoctogram. Another beautiful example is um, the work from the Ruger group where they uh, functionalized um, a simple cantilever that is usually used for AFM uh, microscopy. There you put the system that you want to investigate, in their case a tobacco mosaic virus, on the, on, on, on the, on the tip of your cantilever. You sweep it over um, a magnetic tip that provides you with a, with a, with a, with a, with a magnetic gradient. Um, you introduce an additional um, PC field, and uh, then what, you, what, what, what happens is when you sweep the cantilever over um, this magnetic tip, the spins here um, will couple to the fields, and you will get actually a, a, a position dependent and spin dependent deflection of the cantilever. So, what you do is you just map out, you just monitor the motion of your cantilever, and you can reconstruct in 3D actually the shape of your, of your spin alignments here in, in your tip and therefore of the mosaic virus. And uh, the, 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 the interesting thing in that case is, uh, so for this specific uh, method that then Ruger developed, you see if you compare this um, uh, mechanical resonance force microscopy method to conventional um, MRIs, you get an improvement in volume sensitivity on the order of 10 to the 8. And um, to be fair, I have to say that now, um, people get similar and even better uh, resolution without exploiting the, the mechanical freedom by using the NV center. So this is something that um, has been pointed out uh, several times in several talks. And I think also that Ruga now um, shifts slightly towards the, towards the NV centers. So if you look now at the literature and um, look towards uh, mechan and look into mechanical sensing, so the current state of the art is, is um, you do have single spin detection via this magnetic um, mechanical force uh, resonance microscopy I showed you. With respect to displacement sensing, you achieve, you achieve atometer resolution with respect to force, septo Newton scale, with respect to mass, yoctogram scale, and so on and so on. So mechanical sensors are really very, have very impressive performance. The interesting part is that all of these measurements utilize mechanical sensors that are deeply in the classical regime. So the limitations of all these me measurement methods is normally due to the thermal motion of the cantilever, okay, so of the mechanical device. So it's therefore an extremely intriguing question to ask what happens to all those uh, sensitivities and resolutions if you can make use of the quantum regime. So what if thermal motion is not anymore a topic? What if even in addition you can start squeezing um, below the shot noise your mechanical motion um, and then well, the question is, where do all those resolutions go to? Which regime can we enter? Okay, this is one of the big motivations in studying the quantum regime of such micro and nanomechanical resonators. So, uh, here's a sort of motivational slide. Uh, adding quantum to the mechanical uh, uh, systems opens up uh, essentially a new playground in, in those uh, three sections. Quantum measurement is the one that I already, that, that, that I already uh, uh, motivated a little bit, and I will say a little bit more now on topics of quantum information and quantum foundations. With respect to quantum information, the really novel feature with respect to other implementations in, in quantum devices up to now is that you can functionalize mechanical systems. You okay? have a mechanical system, you put something reflecting on top, you couple to photons. Okay? You put something conducting on top, you couple to charge. You put something uh, magnetic on top, uh, you couple to, to spin, so magnetic flux, and so on. Okay? Um, so this provides you a sort of new flexibility once you manage to couple your individual systems via this functional, functionalization to the mechanical modes strongly. <coughs> so in such a sense that you preserve quantum coherence, then you can imagine having the same or another mechanical system that is coupled to this mechanical system couple now again to a completely different quantum device. So for example, you could use um, uh, such nano micromechanical systems in the quantum regime to act as quantum transducers between, for example, photons and magnetic flux qubits. Right? This, this would be one possibility. So between quantum devices that typically don't interact with each other. 
This is the other strong motivation to investigate those nano and micromechanical systems in the quantum machine. And of course, you can come up now with a, with a plethora of different architectures, and here we are only in the beginning. So right now, there are a couple of pro uh, proposals in the literature, what one could do. Here is one um, example by, by Peter Rabel, uh, together with uh, Peter Zoller and Michel Lukin, where they look at um, an array of uh, spins that are realized via NV centers, and you, you utilize actually a mechanical array to couple to, 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 to um, essentially establish a long-range interaction between those bits. Uh, other examples is to use uh, optomechanical systems as transducers for long-distance uh, quantum communication where, for example, you have spin qubits coupled to lights, then coupled to charge qubits after the long-distance um, uh, uh, propagation. Another aspect, besides the functionalization of these mechanical systems, which makes it interesting also for this quantum information uh, in implementations, is the fact that um, you, uh, uh, you that, that, let's say, is the fact that scalability is something that um, has been shown in the classical domain already. So here is one of my favorite examples. This is the IBM millipedes. Um, many of you might know that. So this is something that I think originally goes back to Dan Ruger. This is a data storage device and an array of cantilevers is actually swept over a polymer matrix and each individual cantilever can imprint a dot into the, into the polymer. Um, it can be read out, it can be, can be erased again by heating the tip and um, this whole thing, and you, and you move now collectively this array so you can write zeros and ones and this whole thing reaches the storage densities of something like um, a terabit per square inch. Um, the, the reason why this is not on the market, although this, these things exist, so I, I've seen those, they have, they have, they have SD format, and they, so IBM has them, but um, it took them too long to actually develop the software to, um, to, to make sense out of this collective uh, motion of, the, of this array. The software is now finished, but by now, uh, but by the time the software is finished, the other memory devices the, uh, that came out in the meantime um, have slightly worse performance with respect to the mechanics, but the price is now so ridiculously low that it doesn't make sense to bring that out in the market anymore. It's very funny. But now they make a lot of money with the software. They can use it now um, in many other uh, uh, implementations. Anyway, so the point that I would like to make here is uh, one of the interesting aspects of uh, these nano and micromechanical devices is you have microfab available that allows you to really um, uh, uh, think about um, scaling these things up once you um, are at the level of single um, mechanical control. The last point that I would like, and, and again, so this is just, these are just a few examples and you can think of many different architectures, and I will mention a few in the end. Um, so the other point, so the last motivation, um, why is it interesting to look into these mechanical systems are um, questions on the foundations of quantum physics. So one of the outstanding ones are, is of course the, uh, the question that many of you might know as the quantum measurement problem. Uh, eventually the, the, the ultimate question is uh, we know from our microscopic experience there is no such thing as a superposition between that and a live cat. So um, who actually killed the cat right, in our microscopic observation? And there are typically two possible answers. Um, the one is standard decoherence just does the job and that's why uh, so in principle if you would do a good enough job, job uh, with a quantum experiment you could see the superposition but it's normally you simply don't have this level of control. <laughs> the other uh, possible answer is well there's new physics going on. So gravity might come in or some, uh, some, some strange background field might come in that we simply don't know yet about that might exist and that we don't have access to. And so the, 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 the motivation from a fundamental physics point of view is to make explicit use of the possibility to now control a collective um, degree of freedom of up to 10 to the 20 atoms, put it into superposition states, <coughs> and now try to ask the questions, okay, at which rate do such superposition states decohere compared with standard quantum predictions um, and test explicitly uh, predictions of uh, alternative theories to quantum theory. And uh, there are a couple of proposals, I cannot, um, I won't have the time to show you that, but this is, uh, so here we have um, published one paper where we describe it, an experiment <coughs> that explicitly 
it is able to test all existing alternative theories to quantum theory, so all of those collapse models. And to my knowledge, that's really the first um, experimental proposal that would be able to test all of them rigorously. Um, it's a very hard experiment, but the message is, in principle, it's possible. You just have to invest a lot of um, time to do that. There are also other possibilities. Um, I think Chasla Brook and Yung Shi Kim have already talked about these, which would be to utilize, the, uh, to, to, to um, actually uh, use the fact that uh, you are now dealing with very large masses and therefore very large momenta to um, test specific predictions of quantum theory of gravity. So that's uh, something that just came out, uh, there was a proposal that just came out um, last week. And um, this, again, is only possible because we are dealing with a collective motion um, of something like 10 to the 10 to the 15, 10 to the 20 atoms close to the quantum region. And because we have this full level of control. Okay, so now the, 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 um, the motivations, as I, as I told you, now um, um, the motivations are manifold to investigate this regime. But now let's ask the, the crucial question, how realistic is it to access this regime? Okay? And if you think about in general, mechanical motion in the quantum regime, then um, I, I see here uh, uh, some well-known faces who know um, very well that this is in quantum physics an old hat. Okay? Mechanical motion in the quantum regime is something that is at the very latest extremely well known since the 90s when people started to think about quantum information processing with trapped ions. Because um, the reason why you can actually have a chain of independent um, uh, ions, each of which carries uh, a qubit that doesn't couple with the other one, that the reason why you can still implement um, now quantum gates that make them interact and then do quantum information processing is because you utilize um, the quantum nature of the collective mechanical motion of this chain of ions as a bus. So the first um, actual mechanical quantum transducer has been explicitly made use of by Zirac and Zoller in their um, in their in their Zirac Zoller game. Okay, and of course this has been realized now many times. And if you if you want, everything I'm going to tell you now makes very blatant use of the concepts that have been developed in this context um, of of um, of trapped ion physics, and I just apply it now to systems that are significantly larger. Okay? Um, also, uh, with respect to uh, now more than, let's say, 7 or 10 or, or, or 20 ions, there have been beautiful experiments recently where people uh, were studying uh, the collective motion of clouds of cold atoms up to 10 to the 5 that were ultra-cold gas, so, the, um, so the, the mechanical aspect of this, of this motion also has been uh, deeply in the quantum regime. What I'm going to talk about is looking at systems that now hit the micrometer regime, so we really have 10 to the 10 and more atoms with, uh, uh, that, that have collectively moved. And here are just three examples of the recent uh, literature where uh, those mechanical systems has been, have been driven into the quantum regime. And I will say some more about that. So, how are we going to use the, the concepts of quantum optics to reach the quantum regime? That is the question now. So what we uh, eventually do is we exploit optomechanical coupling in combination with, um, with quantum optics. Yeah? Optomechanical coupling, again, is old hat. I just want to briefly mention that in passing that, of course, the conjecture of uh, um, mechanical forces of light goes back to Kepler in the 17th century, who uh, conjectured that the uh, reason why the tail of a comet is inclined with respect to its orbit around the sun is because of mechanical forces of light, okay? so radiation pressure. And then it took until the 19th century that Maxwell, we had a theory that would, uh, um, that would eventually confirm it. The first unambiguous demonstrations of radiation pressure go back to Lebedev and Nichols and Hull, so here in Moscow State at Dartmouth College, that demonstrated in this famous light mill experiments for the first time that if you shine a bright light on such torsional resonators, you can actually measure the, the, the deflection of these things. 
why can we do so much better today, or why am I claiming we can do so much better today when this is already such a such a old thing? Well, um, to uh, let's have a look in, in, in our lab in Vienna. We have recently um, manufactured a couple of um, very high high reflective um, cantilevers. They are very long. And the, the, the point is that if you compare now the torsional oscillator um, from the times of Lebedev and Nichols and Hall with what we can do with microfabrication that needs today in our lab, you see the big difference. Mass is on the order of 100 milligrams compared to mass is on the order of 100 nanograms. Spring constants on the order of 10 to the minus 3 newton per meter because of this size now. Okay? So what you have suddenly is you have a system where it's sufficient to simply point a laser pointer on this thing, that it bends and then you can observe the motion. Okay, so this is the big difference. Today we have microfabrication capabilities that allow us to come up with um, here the nice thing. This is actually just oh, this is a black mirror that um, uh, uh, out of which you carve a, a cantilever actually. Um, and if you so this is the uh, uh, wavelength dependent uh, wavelength dependent reflectivity. And you see that the, the, the blue curve is actually the static displacement um, of the cantilever. Okay, so it very, very uh, nicely follows because of radiation pressure. Um, this, this okay. Now, let me very briefly introduce you to the physics. And this is really, um, I'm almost embarrassed to say, but it's extremely simple physics. Okay? <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, uh, I, I give you the classical intuition, then we go to the quantum regime, and then I give you all the, all the examples. So, um, as uh, um, Andreas has already pointed out, um, add a cavity and you get something interesting. Okay, <laughs> so we do that here also. So instead of just having our reflecting cantilever, we shine light on it. We make the situation a little bit more interesting by adding a second mirror. So the mechanical system is highly reflecting. We add a second mirror, so we have light that is now trapped here between those two mirrors. But this thing is now mechanically moving. There are three things that um, actually happens. The very first thing um, is if you think of what happens to the light itself if it's reflected from such a mechanical system. So you pump this cavity reson on resonance, which means that the cavity length is now just a multiple of the wavelength of the light. Okay? Uh, so you have um, maximum, maximum light inside the cavity now. And the phase of the light that is reflected from this mechanical system will depend on the position of this mirror. Okay, e actually, even without the cavity mirror here, this is true. Okay? So, um, if you displace this mechanical system a little bit, the phase of the reflected light will be different. Okay? Very trivial, uh, very, very trivial uh, um, statement. But now, if you increase the intensity of the light, the displacement will increase, so the phase will increase. Now, I put a black box around that. And what I just told you is, I have a beam of light that goes into the black box, and if I increase my intensity, the phase shift of the light that comes out of the black box again is increased. So I have an intensity dependent phase shift of the light that comes out of my black box. If I would have asked you before this lecture what is inside the black box, most of you would have said, oh, it's a care medium. There's a nonlinear crystal in the box, right? Because that's what a care medium does. It provides an intensity dependent phase shift. So what I just told you is that just a cavity with a mechanically moving element acts as a nonlinear optical medium. And we will make use of that later on in the context of extremely strong optical and nonlinearities on a chip. So this is a, uh, actually a prospect for new classical application also. Uh, and just to say that uh, this has been realized, this is what I just said, already in the 90s by people doing theoretical quantum optics. But um, they, so they already read, wrote papers what super cool experiments in quantum optics you can do in, by, by just replacing um, uh, uh, nonlinear crystals with such devices. The problem was, at that time in the 90s, there was no way that people could fabricate um, uh, such systems with sufficient uh, optomechanical coupling that they could exploit anything. Yeah. Now, so this is the one thing. You have, a, you have, a, you have an optical nonlinearity. Now comes another thing, and that is, the, that, is, that is the even more intriguing part. If we now don't pump our cavity uh, on resonance, but we pump it detuned, what does it mean? Well, here we have the intra-cavity intensity okay, as of the laser field as a function of length of the cavity. So detuned means now that my cavity length is not any longer multiple of my, of my pump, uh, pump wavelength. 
So I'm sitting somewhere here, let's say. Okay? So I'm sitting at the, at the slope here. So if my mechanical system now moves, so changes the cavity length, you see what happens is that I increase and decrease the cavity length. But that also means that I increase and decrease my intra-cavity intensity. That means I change the radiation pressure. Okay? But what I just told you now is I have a mechanical system and I add a position-dependent force. Right? That's what we just did. If the mechanical system is here, sits here, then dependent on its position, you will have more or less radiation pressure. And that's mechanics 101. If I have a harmonic oscillator and I add a position-dependent force, I change the spring constant. Okay? And that's what's called the optical spring. Okay? That's it. So you can actually control with the light here, just by adding a little cavity, you can control now the spring constant of the mechanical system. But you can do even more, because it's a cavity. So the cavity has a finite lifetime. What does that mean? It means that if you change the cavity length, the intra-cavity field won't change instantaneously. It will take a finite time until the intra-cavity field will catch up. So that means that the force is retarded. Okay? So it's an harmonic oscillator, you have a position-dependent force, but now the force is retarded in time. So instead of coupling to position, you couple it to the degree of freedom that, um, that corresponds to retardation in time, and that is momentum. So again, physics 101, harmonic oscillator, and a momentum-dependent force, you change the damping. Okay? So what I just told you now is that we do have now control over the real and the imaginary part of the mechanical susceptibility, which means over everything you want to have in a mechanical system. Super. Um, here's another, here's another uh, picture of that um, in, in terms of, a, let's say, heat engine, an optomechanical heat engine. Um, what I just told you is, um, here is uh, the optical spring. So my cavity moves, the intra-cavity intensity changes instantaneously. The overall work that I perform is the integral over this thing, which is zero. Right? So I just change the spring constant without performing any work. But if I add now a cavity lifetime, you see that if I change my position, it takes some time until the cavity field actually uh, um, uh, 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 adapts. So that means I have the force follows actually this closed loop here. So that means again that the work that I perform is actually non-zero. And now depending on which side I sit on my, uh, on my tuning, I either perform work on my mechanical system via the radiation field, or I extract work from the mechanical system via radiation field. Okay? So, I have an optomechanical heat engine. Good. This is the classical part, and um, one, by now, not any more so surprising aspect that I would like to point out, if you ask now, okay, this is very trivial, and this has been pointed out in the 1960s already by Braginsky. Okay? And in the 70s, Braginsky, in the, in the context of uh, actually gravitational wave detectors, these Weber bar detectors where they couple it to, 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 to microwave uh, um, cavities, um, demonstrated already um, these effects. But what about the optical case? Okay? It took until 2000, 2003 and 2005 to realize for the first time in the case of optics those effects. And the reason simply was because there was no um, sufficiently high quality optomechanical system available that would be able to, to show that. Okay? Um, so <laughs> there are very nice uh, stories again to tell you about all these um, uh, experiments, but for, for, for reasons of time I guess I will just um, skip that. Uh, you can ask me if you're interested. <laughs> so I give you now the quantum picture. Okay. And one of the pictures is the following. Everything I said is just the classical motivation, but of course you can frame that into, uh, you can phrase it in a full, uh, you can put it in a full quantum framework. So let's do that, just for the sake of the argument. So how would we do it? Well, we say we have a cavity field, um, and the cavity mode, which is described by some, 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 some A, and the mechanical mode, which is described by a B. And um, what happens if the mechanics moves is it couples to the cavity frequency. So the mechanical motion changes the cavity frequency. Okay? This, is, this is actually the main point. You need a cavity where um, the, the, the mechanical motion couples either to the frequency or to some other cavity property like the cavity microphone. Now, 
Let's consider the regime where we drive the cavity strongly. So we have a pump beam. And um, let's consider the regime where we pump our cavity. So here's the frequency space. We pump our cavity detuned. I already told you what's going to happen, okay? But let's just now from a quantum optics point of view see what's happened. From a quantum optics point of view, if we detune the pump by, let's say, a mechanical frequency, then the only way to scatter a photon from the pump into the cavity is by getting some extra energy. Where does the energy come from? Well, it comes from a mechanical system. Okay? So that's what's happening. So you create a cavity photon by taking the energy from the mechanics. And if you drive strong and long enough, then of course the converse process is also going to, is also going to take place. So what you have is a, co is a coherent energy exchange between the light and the mechanics. And in two more quantum optics, that's known as a beam split. Okay? And that is actually the action that people are using if they want to store light into atomic vapor, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So uh, you already get the flavor where this is going to. At the same time, if your cavity decays very fast, you see that once you scatter a photon in there, you have, you have given a photon to the radiation field, and if the radiation field, the photon now decays very fast again, you cool the whole thing. Okay? And this is um, the, the quantum aspect of work is being performed on the, on the system. Um, if you go to the blue side, let's make the same argument again. You scatter all a photon into the cavity then and only then if you also create a mechanical excitation. So you have now a joint uh, create, uh, creation of a joint excitation and in two more quantum optics, um, this is known as a two mole squeezing interaction or a down conversion interaction. Okay? So light and mechanics are now coupled, and these are the fundamental interactions that take place. So what I have just told you now is that what we have available now with a strongly pumped cavity, where we can just change the tuning, and we have a mechanical system that couples to the cavity frequency, we have now a full quantum optics toolbox that allows us to prepare mechanical systems in any arbitrary quantum state we want by just choosing our um, optical field in the way we want. Okay? And that's super exciting. So for me, that was sort of, that was sort of my, um, how do you say, enlighten, enlightening <laughs> um, or awakening, whatever, Turmzimmer Erlebnis, right? So that's, the, that's what, um, what, what happened to Pascal <laughs> in a different context. Um, uh, so when, when I realized that, it was clear, okay, now we can do everything. But of course, it requires something. So it requires, first of all, if you really want to talk quantum, you want to apply those um, interactions here on a system that is already in a pure state. Because otherwise, um, if you apply a unitary to a mixed state, you will still end up in a mixed state, don't see anything. Right? So what does it mean? You want to have the mechanical state somewhere in a minimum entropy state, some pure state. So that's why you simply best cool it into the quantum ground state. Right? Secondly, your coupling better be large compared to all the coherence rates that you have in the system. And the strongest ones are, of course, um, your cavity decay rate and the coupling to the, to the thermal environment via the mechanics. Okay? That's what you need to do, and that's what people are working on right now and are quite successfully working on right now. Uh, just for the quantum optics folks here in the audience, this is, sort of, this is always my take-home message for the people. So in quantum optics, in two more quantum optics, that I stole this picture from Chad Kimball, what you typically have is a nonlinear crystal. You pump this crystal strongly, and what this nonlinear interaction does, it correlates your signal and idler modes. And normally by the down conversion interactions are in a way that you generate quantum correlations. And what quantum optic mechanics does for you is, um, it's exactly the same, however you just replace one of the, op of the optical modes by mechanical. That's it. And the nonlinearity is provided by your, by your uh, uh, um, optomechanical cavity. Okay? That's the only thing you need to remember about this talk. And then you know almost everything about quantum optomechanics. Okay? Good. Now, if you, if you, if you go into the, the quantum optics laboratories around the world, uh, this is again one of the very fascinating um, aspects of this field, is you will see that um, the many different devices span um, frequency, mass, and size ranges over many, many, many orders of magnitudes. So, with respect to mass, basically you almost spend 20 orders of magnitude. So, from the 10 to the 5 atoms collectively moving in a cavity, 
over nanoscale uh, waveguides um, to microtoroids, to thorlapse mirrors, to kilogram mirrors in gravitational wave okay. And it's all one and the same coupling, and remarkably, in most cases, almost with the, with the similar coupling rates. Okay. With respect to frequency, it's the same. Right? Um, and with respect to dimension, also. Okay, now, I told you we have those, we have those interactions, um, and uh, let's not just make use of them. So with, with, with respect to cooling, this was actually the first thing that was, that was realized from this community. Uh, it started essentially in 2004 with a, with a work by Karai, and then we used photothermal forces for cooling, and then um, uh, we started in 2006 with uh, the works in radiation pressure, and as you can see, back to back to back to back with many, many other groups around the world. Uh, again, just the, the physics once more, uh, now maybe in an atomic language, that's the nice thing, you can just phrase it in any, any language that you want, is you pump, you carry the detuned, um, the motion of the mechanics creates sidebands, so you have uh, essentially anti-stokes and stokes scattering sidebands, and uh, because of the cavity, uh, you can have resonantly enhanced scattering into the anti-stoke sideband, which provides you with the cooling process. Okay? And that's what we did, and um, it has actually very, very, from very early on been realized that this is of course equivalent to what the iron people are doing um, with, with, with the resolved side pad cooling. Yeah. Because the, 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 moving, um, the moving mechanical system just creates sideband in your cavity spectrum, and if your side is resolved, then you have just this nice ladder that you can use, and then you just go down and you cool to the ground. Now, uh, here's just an example from Vienna. So, um, we, we started out back in 2006 with cooling from 400 Kelvin to something like 8 Kelvin. Um, with uh, cantilevers that were fabricated out of optical coating. Um, this was done at room temperature, then we improved um, in a couple of works by here going for the first time into a cryostat with such an optomechanical system, here improving the mechanics, and um, only recently, uh, this uh, was in collaboration with the group Oscar Painter at Caltech, actually a nanomechanical system that we cooled now into the quantum ground state. We have now in our lab, um, so this was all at helium-4 temperatures, those, four uh, those, those three experiments. We have now uh, a closed cycle illusion refrigerator where we put those systems in and we expect that this will bring us another one or two orders of magnitude by pre-cooling the system. Um, well, actually, I just wanted to show you how this eventually looks like in the lab, but I think for, uh, I will just speed that up. So, just the essence is you have here your optomechanical system. Um, in our case, for example, this was a silicon nitride membrane with a mirror pad on top. This was all uh, fabricated, uh, very low absorption. And um, here you have a system, you, uh, you uh, actually have a laser. You have two beams, one beam that locks the laser frequency to the cavity and reads out the mechanics, and the other one is now the physics beam that pumps this cavity strongly in a detuned fashion and sucks out the energy and then it just this was then the experiment uh, with the painter group. So in that case, the system is uh, integrated optical and mechanical um, nanoscale waveguide. The patterning here uh, suggests that you have a photonic crystal induced band gap. So you, uh, this is patterning here provides you with band gaps both for the optical modes and for the uh, and for the mechanical modes. So you have a co-localization actually of optics and mechanics here in the center of this of this nanomechanical waveguide which creates an extremely strong optomechanical coupling and uh, we use that then to simply cool down from 4 Kelvin which was on, on the order of 100 quanta um, down to below 1 um, just by um, detuning. Um, well, you, you can go on and go on but um, actually I think I will so you just believe me, you can also do entanglement, that's something we're working on right now, by just exploiting here this picture that I told you, this is how people in tumor quantum optics generate continuous rebel entanglement, use the down conversion of the action, and um, again, we can also do that, and that's what we're working on right now. It's an experiment that is in progress. Um, before you actually enter the regime of entanglement, what happens is, you have to pump your system very strongly, so you actually enter a regime of strong coupling between the optical field and the mechanical system. Okay? So what happens is, 
that um, you generate inside the cavity now an hybrid optomechanical system. So essentially, your um, your mechanical system is your, is now dressed by the cavity field, and um, what you get is these typical signatures of, optome uh, of of strong coupling. You get normal mode splitting in the emission spectrum um, of your cavity. This is very similar to having a mono triplet in a strongly coupled uh, atomic system, for example. And recently, so we did this experiment back in 2009, and recently there were a couple of other works that also demonstrated a strong coupling in different implementations. So one of these was a microwave implementation. So instead of optical fields, you can also use microwave fields, of course. Um, there are some preliminary results for the entanglement, but um, actually I, I don't want to go into the details here. Um, one point that is interesting, I just told you, a uh, possible interpretation of this um, of, of, of seeing this normal mode splitting. This is from, from atom optics, and I would like to stick with this analogy from, from, from uh, atomic physics. So you can view actually our strongly pumped optomechanical cavity in analogy to such a strongly driven two-level system. Um, the, the point is, this is something that Andreas also in his introduction has pointed out. If you have many oscillators, actually your level spacing um, is, is equidistant. This is what we have naturally, and that's what you also have in a strongly driven um, two-level system because the, the splitting scales with the square root of the number of excitations, and if you are at, at high occupation, then the square root of n is simply equivalent to the square root of n plus 1. But if you go now into a regime of weak driving, okay, then, and this is, this is the similarity now with atomic physics, also in the case of optomechanical physics, you actually have some nonlinearities entering. I, didn't talk to you about that, and I didn't write down Hamiltonians and so on. You just have to believe me now that the um, interaction is intrinsically nonlinear between the mechanics and and the photon. So it's actually it's the photon number that couples to the um, to the mechanical system originally. And this is why if you now work in the few photon regime, you suddenly do get actually a splitting that is highly nonlinear. And the question is now, can you enter this regime of, um, of nonlinear optomechanical coupling? And the question is, uh, the answer is maybe. Uh, so this is a route that we are, that we are going right now. Um, so here is actually um, a plot where, where, where we plotted all the different optomechanical realizations right now um, uh, as, a, as a, you see, cooperativity of the system versus the mechanical frequency. And cooperativity um, essentially shows you how um, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, actually um, uh, uh, shows you how strongly um, your, your um, optomechanical system is coupled. So the C is essentially the, 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 the coupling um, constant, uh, the optomechanical coupling constant divided by the product, that is divided by the square of the product of the two uh, decoherence rates in the system. And um, these devices that we used, or actually that Oscar Painter um, uh, has fabricated is optomechanical crystals. They have an extremely strong optomechanical coupling because of this co-localization of the optical and the mechanical modes on this, um, on this, uh, uh, on this nanomechanical structure here. And um, we are right now um, uh, uh, preparing an experiment where we put this system into a dilution refrigerator the mechanical modes are somewhere in the few gigahertz regime. So if you put that in a dill fridge at 20 millikelvin, the mechanics is already fully frozen out. And then you can exploit now only with a few photon driving, actually, um, the regime of strong optical nonlinearity. So it should be possible to produce extremely strong optical squeezing just with a the very weak driving and using those structures. And also to um, go into the regime of strong single photon nonlinearity. So for example, where the presence of a single photon actually blocks a second photon to enter the cavity. This is one of the, the possible implementations that one can think of. Um, and also, uh, you, you, you can do various non-Gaussian uh, non state preparations. You can also have single photon detectors that actually subtract photons now from the dry field, and so on and so on. So this is just, this is work in progress, but I think this is the right platform to combine now high-frequency mechanics in a plane, so it's really on-chip mechanics now uh, with the low-temperature um, physics. Another uh, outlook here is, of course, so you can't read that here, it says thoughts on chip quantum information processing. Um, I think this is a very intriguing outlook. Um, you have here one example in mechanical storage of light. So both the groups of Oscar Paint and of Tobias Kippenberg um, uh, discovered, suggested, and realized actually a regime 
of electromagnetically induced transparency that is realized inside optomechanical crystals. So you know that EIT can be used to actually store light and so on. And this is something that they, are, um, that, that they, that they have been realizing. They simply make use of, a, of an interference effect um, to, to, to generate such a transparency window in the, in the cavity response. Um, just, to, just to point that out very briefly, one of the beautiful aspects of those structures of the, of the, of the painter group is that you can think of completely in-plane designs of optomechanical cavities where you then can start um, making arrays of those things um, just by patterning those um, SOI surfaces and adding mechanics just by undercutting bits and pieces. Okay, so this is a, I think this is a highly interesting platform and um, there's going to be lots of progress being made in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the next few uh, years. Uh, another thing, now this is complete vision, okay, so don't take me wrong, this is my, um, well, that's just, fat, this is completely into the blue slide, um, so maybe one can think even of uh, new architecture. So here is a uh, photonic crystal cavity made out of diamond. We heard uh, beautiful talks about NV centers. So let's implant individual NVs now into this diamond. Then you have individual spins. We have mechanical modes. Okay. The eye modes are quite large in a 10 gigahertz regime of those of those beams. And now you could actually use optomechanical coupling to um, actually address the individual uh, qubits on such a nano-diamond uh, matrix, and then just make use of um, uh, iron iron trap physics. To make the spins interact with each other. Maybe even more crazy, we just take a single nanosphere, okay, and we put different NV centers into the nanosphere. The NV centers coupled to the compressional mode of this nanosphere. The compressional mode is somewhere in the order of a few hundred gigahertz, so that means even at room temperature, um, those things are already in a quantum regime, so you do have mechanical quantum transducers um, that might allow you to, to actually. Um, use them as a quantum bus between those NV centers. Right? So, I don't know, maybe you can realize a 10 qubit quantum computer in a 20 nanometer nanosphere. Who knows? I have no idea. I think this is an extremely intriguing perspective to actually have um, just a crystal and then you do quantum information processing at room temperature in a single crystal by making use of those uh, mechanical modes. And I think in Wormsley's group has uh, recently made an extremely nice step in this direction where they explicitly uh, um, uh, uh, addressed the, the acoustic modes of a, of, a, of a microscopic object. And um, if you make the object smaller, there's a chance that you couple to the NVs and then uh, you generate sidebands, and the sidebands you can address again by optical pumping and blah blah blah. So, as I said, okay, it's a complete vision. I don't know where this is leading to, but I think this is uh, very funny to invest in. Um, so, we are looking, by the way, into nanospheres right now. So we have nanospheres inside optical cavities. I don't have the time to talk about that. Um, it's for a completely different purpose. What we are actually looking into um, are questions like, can we actually test Schrodinger Sch Newton equation? This is something, this is now completely into the field of, um, of, of, of um, foundational physics. There are some proposals that have to do actually um, with the question of wave function collapse by gravity. Um, they make sort of implicit use of those uh, Schrodinger and Newton equations, and the question is when we generate the superposition states, um, can, we, can, can we test uh, specific predictions of those, of those underlying dynamics and actually falsify those models, which is my personal, personal opinion what's going to happen. Um, the very last point I would like to make um, is that we are also working on uh, new ways of controlling these mechanical systems in a quantum regime and one thing that we are doing is uh, looking into the pulse regime. So the idea is here that by making very strong and very short pulses on a time scale much smaller than the mechanical frequency, you can actually basically freeze the motion of your system um, and what you do is you correlate um, in the, the instantaneous phase information of the light with the position information of the light. So in other words, you simply entangle the two and now by making a conditional homodyne phase measurement of the light that comes out, you can actually manipulate your mechanical system. And what, what you will achieve by a single pulse is actually, this is shown here, you can actually achieve a single shot squeezing of your mechanical state. And also if you, if you do a little more sophisticated um, pulsing techniques, that's something that we proposed recently, actually Alex Retzka proposed recently, we collaborated in there. You can actually, by having pulses that interfere, even just simply engineer your interactions. 
in a very nice way. Uh, we are, just to show you that, so we are working in that direction. So here is a cut through phase space of a mechanical resonator. This is just a thermal distribution of our resonator. We apply a very short pulse, a very strong pulse, and now make a conditional um, measurement of the mechanical position quadrature. And you see that a single shot already um, squashes in that case. So this is squeezing um, below the thermal distribution right now. We, see. we are pushing that now further and want to see whether we can squeeze it. See, when we can see is a real squeeze. Um, well, and this is uh, actually at the at the um, at the basis of the proposals that just up in Munich were talking about to test the predictions of quantum gravity, which I won't have time to talk about. Okay, here's my summary. Um, I showed that already. So I really think that um, adding quantum to mechanics opens up this new playground uh, for many different um, directions in foundations in quantum information in quantum measurement, and I would just like to point out for the, for the very end that the development of this field has been really uh, breathtaking. Um, uh, uh, at the time when we started that, this was back in 2005-2006, this was sort of the number of groups that were working on this topic or related uh, worldwide. Okay? Um, if you look around um, today, okay, then uh, and it seems that, uh, it tells you it's a vibrant field, which means that Everyone seems to have something vibrating in his lab, right? And so <laughs> it's very simple to just to just um, add to your existing experiments a mechanical um, degree of freedom. But what's also very nice that um, in 2010, actually, Nature um, uh, uh, um, uh, selected this, this field of optical mechanics as one of the la uh, as the last milestones in a, in a list of um, uh, uh, achievements in, in in photonic sciences. And as I said. So we are there, we do have mechanical systems in the quantum regime, it's only the beginning and I just told you about optomechanics, but as you can see, and I told you also, you can couple to all the other degrees of freedom, um, and this has been done, and um, yeah, with this outlook I would like to stop here. So here's my collaborators whom I really would like to thank um, a lot, and this is my group. Uh, we are right now collaborating in particular with the group of uh, Oscar Painter on those integrated structure theory support by Clemens Hammer, Peter Abel and Jens Eisler and the fundamental questions with Jasla Fruckner and uh, Minji King. And with this I would like to thank you for your attention. Questions? Does